Good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining the Sri Lanka Medical Association's uh, virtual conference. This session is about uh, leaving no one behind. Uh, we want to explore how we could improve access to sexual and reproductive health services and quality care for all. Uh, joining us uh, from Sri Lanka physically, we have Ritsu Nakan from UNFPA and Professor Hemanta Sena Nayaka. Uh, firstly, I would uh, like to invite Ritsu to speak a few words. Ritsu assumed her position as the United Nations Populations Fund representative in Sri Lanka and country director in Maldives in February 2017. Prior to this assessment, assignment, she was the UNFPA deputy representative in Vietnam. As a passionate international civil servant of UNFPA, she has led a number of policy advocacy initiatives related to the population policies gender-based violence, and youth development. During her over 20 years of service with the United Nations, she also held positions as head of the UN Resident Coordinator's Office in Ethiopia, learning and training specialist as, at the UN System Staff College in Italy, and the UN Coordination uh, Specialist in the Pacific region, based in Fiji. Through these assignments, she contributed to a number of joint UN initiatives, including policy advocacy, Strategy Development and Capacity Building. Ritsu has a master's degree in nonprofit management from the Milano Graduate School of International Affairs, Management and Urban Policy in New York, and a Bachelor of Arts degree from the International Christian University in Tokyo. Thank you for the kind introduction. <clears throat> Distinguished panel members and uh, all participants online and offline, a very good morning to you all. It is really my pleasure to address all of you from here in Colombo. And I'd like to really thank um, the participants, as well as the panelists and the um, Sri Lanka Medical Association for this opportunity. And I'd like to congratulate on this 133rd annual academic sessions of the SLMA such a history and uh, substantive knowledge here, which I really think uh, we should cherish and uh, really uh, bring forward for the future of Sri Lanka. So the, um, as we all know that the COVID-19 pandemic changed our world and our lives in many different ways. And reflecting on the discussion about the pandemic and the new normal over the past few months, I feel that the discourse around what kind of future we want and what kind of uh, recovery we need to pursue has been shifting. And more than ever before, the pandemic brought to the light that the issue of equity and equality, and this is the specifically about this panel discussion is about. What does this mean to us working in the health sector broadly? I think we must pay so much more attention to the social determinants of health and equal access to quality sexual reproductive health services has to be part of the universal health coverage. The conversation today is a really important part of this process to making this a reality. And clearly in order to address this old issue in the new context, we need to be very innovative adaptive, and looking at the very much client-oriented, um, client-centered approach. So as much as the, uh, the pandemic is a horrific tragedy, I believe it provides a very good opportunity to reflect on and change the way we work and the way we live our lives. And how do we need to change the, work we, the, the way we work I believe the key is to be more serious about the frameworks that we already developed and the commitments that uh, we already have made. For example, the International Conference on Population Development, ICPD, whose 25th anniversary we celebrated together last year, a bold vision that integrates health, gender equality, human rights, environment and accountability was already presented and uh, supported by the world leaders. And through the dialogue at the ICPD, women's reproductive rights were embraced 
as a fundamental part of sustainable development. This holistic approach, which was articulated in the ICPD program of action, needs to be once again taken forward to accelerate our progress towards rights and choices for all. For UNFPA, this means achieving three zeros, zero unmet need for family planning, zero preventable maternal death, zero gender-based violence and harmful practices by 2030. To achieve these three zeros, we believe that in many countries, the health sector must change. Universal health coverage cannot be just an ideal scenario that the governments aspire to achieve, but we must make it happen right now. Although Sri Lanka is known as a very effective uh, country in terms of health sector capacity and functioning and achieved the major um, uh, progress in terms of maternal health or various indicators, we believe that the country still has a long way to go to ensure rights and choices for all. In particular, in the areas of sexual reproductive health services, deep-rooted social norms and stigma around these issues are preventing progress to be made. For example, as long as family planning is, seen as is not seen as necessary for women's agency and choice, we have serious unfinished business in terms of sexual reproductive health. Another key element is the necessary change in inclusive inclusiveness. We are aware that there are segments of populations in Sri Lanka that, and across the world we have limited access to the SRH services. This includes LGBTQI community, people living with HIV, people with disabilities, and the list goes on. But very often, the uh, access is not the issue of physical access, but the social barriers at, uh, such as stigma and the discrimination. We need to ensure that they won't be excluded from the quality services. This is also spirit of the sustainable development goals, leaving no one behind. We need a new mindset and new approach to achieve these existing commitments. It should also be recognized that today's interrelated world, the health sector alone cannot improve health and well-being of every individual. More than ever before, cross-sectoral coordination and cooperation are needed. Just as COVID-19 showed us clearly how the, the world is interrelated and interconnected. For example, to ensure adolescent health, we need to engage other sectors than health ensuring the young people has uh, access to the quality and uh, youth-friendly, youth-centered services through different uh, sectors, including education and uh, the pr private sectors. We need to design also a policy and intervention based on very solid evidence. Once again, this is not a very new issue, but we need to do much better to use accurate and the real-time disaggregated data, which can capture the detailed lived experience of the populations. Particularly from the perspective of client-oriented service provision, I believe that we have a lot to do to make sure that we have sufficient data on how we can improve services. As Sri Lanka addressed last mile challenges, the need for the accurate real-time and disaggregated data is more uh, evident than ever before, so, so that we can provide very targeted interventions that are inclusive and holistic. So I'd like to stop here. Um, I'm very much looking forward to this panel discussion that I'm sure will provide very rich and insightful um, discussion. And uh, I would like to thank again the panelists, participants in the SLMA for the commitment and the partnership with us to work towards rights and choices for all. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ritsu. Um, I'd like to introduce myself. I'm Shrial. I am currently uh, a program officer with the Family Planning Association, uh, working on a global fund-funded uh, multi-country grant uh, that is looking at uh, the advocacy field around HIV services. 
Um, I will be moderating the discussion today and um, I wanted to, I, I think Ritsu uh, set the background really well for the discussion uh, around uh, client-centered services and kind of having a rights-based approach. Uh, during this time uh, with COVID-19, we have all been compelled to relook at how we provide services with the same kind of standards under different type of system which meant we are relying on limited service deliveries, but utilizing communication methods previously uh, untested um, while maintaining safety regulations as well. So our discussion today will be revolving around how we make sure to be inclusive of all marginalized groups uh, when we provide these services around sexual and reproductive health services. Uh, we hope to understand the experiences of, uh, as Ritsu said, um, various marginalized communities and the intersecting forms of discrimination related to sexual and reproductive health, uh, touching on gender-based violence as well as legal protection as well as service delivery. Uh, so joining us today for the panel discussion, we have four distinguished speakers from different disciplines and medical fields as well as community to provide us with a wholesome discussion. Uh, firstly, uh, virtually we have uh, Professor Susan Swoyer, Dr. Susan Sawyer holds the Chair of Adolescent Health at the University of Melbourne. She's the Director of Centre of Adolescent Health at the Royal Children's Hospital, a WHO collaborating centre for Adolescent Health, and was the Commissioner for the Lancet Commission on Adolescent Health and Wellbeing. Uh, she's a paediatrician by training and helped advance the field of adolescent health in Australia, Southeast Asia, and increasingly internationally through her role as President of the International Association of Adolescent Health. She also leads the Special Advisory Group for Adults and Medicine for the International Pediatric, Pedi Pediatric Association. Her research interests primarily relate to quality of healthcare services for adolescents. Uh, next, we have uh, Professor Hemant Sena Nayaka from Sri Lanka, who is an emeritus professor of the University of Colombo. He's an obst obstetrician and gynecologist by profession. He holds memberships of the Human Rights, Refugees and Violence Against Women's Committee of the International Federation of Obst Obstetric and Gynecological Societies and the Technical Advisory Committee of the Southeast Regional Office of the WHO. We also have Ms. Tanzila Khan, who is the founder of Girly Things uh, Pakistan, through which she delivers uh, sanitary napkins and other products and also urgent menstruation menstrual kits to women anywhere in public across Pakistan, catering to women in small cities and villages, uh, along with metropolitan cities. She wrote her first book, uh, A Story of Mexico, when she was 16, and sold her books to fund the community projects in the fields of disability, women's empowerment, education, and environment. Her NGO is Creative Ally that trains and empowers the community through event and projects. She launched her company, I Wish, to create sustainable solutions to achieve the SDGs. Tanzila has also been a public speaker and a trainer across 19 countries and has been awarded fellowships such as Young Connector of the Future by Swedish Institute Young Leader by Women Deliver. She also ventured into filmmaking and acting uh, to project disability through a heartwarming short film called Fruit Chart. Uh, joining us will also be Dr. Suchitra Dalvi. Uh, she's a practicing gynecologist with over two decades of experience in the development sector. She was director medical at the Family Planning Association of India for seven years before she co-founded co the Asia Safe Abortion Partnership in 2008. She is a trainer for gender and rights issues with a strong belief in social justice. Uh, speaking uh, with us first is uh, Professor Susan Swoyer. This is a bit um, new for me also, it's first virtual conference. So uh, Professor Susan Sawyer will be joining us virtually. Um, I'd like to uh, direct uh, a question towards uh, Professor Susan Sawyer in order to discuss uh, some of her experiences working in Australia providing care for adolescent health. Um, I would like to know uh, what do you see as improvements and challenges over the past five to ten years and what can we take away from your experience uh, in terms of client-centric treatment services, online health, school health systems, as well as primary care-centered treatment services? 
Well, very warm regards to you all, and I'm just delighted to have the honour of participating in the 133rd um, uh, anniversary conference. So um, to be doing this virtually is um, not quite the same as being there in person with you. And I must say, in the middle of Melbourne's in a second COVID-19 shutdown period, I would much prefer to be in Colombo than in Melbourne. However, when I think about the question that you've just been, you've posed, you know, what's, what are some of the improvements and then challenges over the past five to 10 years? I think in Australia, the good news is that over the past decade, my sense is that there's been far greater awareness of adolescence as a transformative period when young people are neither children nor yet experienced and independent adults and a sense that that age group that we're talking about is really the 10 to 24 year old age group. And that's really very much informed by our knowledge of both timing of social role transitions as well as brain development that as we know continues into the mid twenties. And I think consistent with that, there's also in Australia growing appreciation, not there yet, but growing appreciation that policy responses within health need to both protect young people as we do with younger children, as well as empower uh, young people to be more able to take charge of their health, consistent with the United Nations Convention on the Rights of the Child. And the earlier comments that Ritsu made about um, patient-centred care, I think, are really important here, because as a paediatrician, as my discipline, um, the, the reverse of patient-centred care, if you like, is family-centred care. But I think when we're thinking about the care delivered to adolescents, there need to be elements of both patient and family-centred care, and nowhere is that more relevant than for sexual and reproductive health. And I also think in Australia, we've become better at recognising that beyond health problems in adolescence, that many of the health risks for later adult high health um, and later adult life have their onset during adolescence and you know, the example of tobacco is obviously the most obvious where um, you know, tobacco has its onset up typically under the age of 18 but all of the health um, uh, uh, impacts are you know often decades later and that's obviously got incredibly important implications for prevention. And then finally I think there's a sense that we're much better at appreciating therefore given all of that, that we need to be investing more in adolescents, recognising that those investments that we make, and this is using the, the Lancet language of the Lancet Commission on Adolescent Health, this notion of the triple dividend, that those investments we make pay off during adolescence itself, for example, fewer deaths by suicide or fewer unplanned pregnancies, fewer STIs, fewer HIV cases in adolescence itself, uh, better health as those young people mature into adulthood, and then the intergenerational benefits that come when, for example, women are older um, when they parent and are more educated and then have healthier children when they choose, if they choose to parent. But um, in terms of challenges, there are still huge numbers of challenges here. We're still not thinking well enough how best to deliver healthcare really to adolescents. Young people are still struggling to understand their health needs, let alone once they might have a sense of what they are challenged with, how they present to health services, the notion of health literacy. And in that sense, I think we are increasingly appreciating that it is the responsibility of health services rather than adolescents themselves to identify and then address adolescents' health needs rather than the other way around. And so I'd give the example when we think of um, a sexually active adult woman who has experience of contraception and hopefully feels sufficiently empowered to attend uh, an appointment uh, with a request for contraception, this will be far less likely to occur for adolescents who in every country are the population with the greatest unmet need for contraception. Um, and this is where even uh, if young people know that they're at risk of pregnancy, uh, if, if they're sexually active without contraception, the multiplicity of barriers just still means that they won't request. And so this challenge of how is it that if young people are presenting primarily to primary care around standard coughs and colds, around skin conditions like acne and around common injuries, uh, how is it that we use the opportunity of those consultations for what we refer to in a 
Australia and around the world is routine psychosocial assessment for screening of where young people's health needs are as the equivalent of, if you like, blood pressure screening for hypertension as we would in older adults. But if I can about those, these issues make two other points. And one is about our greater appreciation of the complex interrelationships around health. For example, how is it that our health systems are able to recognize that young people who engage in risky sexual health practices are more likely to have wider needs in relationship to say intimate partner violence, past abuse, pain, trauma, sexual orientation, sexual identity, substance use, let alone mental health needs. And therefore we need to be ensuring that whatever the entry point is into the healthcare system, that it is able to deal with this complexity. Um, and that's particularly challenging for adolescents. And the problem is that many countries' traditional models of care are devised around, if you like, more simple presentations such as infectious diseases. And for me, this highlights the critical role of primary care services that we, we may come back to. And the second point then is needing to think more creatively about settings for delivering health services to adolescents rather than simply health consultations within clinics or hospitals. And there's growing interest in the role of schools as a really important setting for health. We're used to thinking with WHO's notions of health promoting schools as schools as a setting for, if you like, whole of health interventions that are around schools as a safe place for children to be and adolescents to be, physical um, safety, social safety in terms of relationships, including for young people who are same sex attracted or particularly those um, with uh, particular you know, aspects of um, gender identity issues. But I think it's also increasingly recognising the opportunity of schools as a site of delivery of health services. And in my own state of Victoria, we've just recently invested in, um, uh, the government has invested in 100 uh, schools, most 100 disadvantaged schools now have part-time doctors and uh, nurses within those delivering health care, trying to, in a sense, provide universal health care free of charge to the most vulnerable young, young people um, whose parents perhaps aren't able to prioritise their health needs. And this is, I think, a really important example of what might be ahead of us here. You did talk about some of the, um, uh, I, I don't know, Shreya, whether you, you want me at this stage to talk a little bit more about primary care, because I would certainly be happy to do so, or perhaps we leave uh, that for questions. Yes, Professor. Uh, sorry, I mean, I would like you to touch a little bit about care primary center. care centered treatment. treatment. Mm -hmm. Okay, so one of the challenges, and um, I think it was Ritsu who described, you know, the quality of um, Sri Lanka's health system in general, but typically as countries get wealthier and health systems mature, there is greater focus on special medical specialization. And it's an incredibly important aspect of driving quality and improving health outcomes. However, the older and perhaps wiser I get, the more I am coming to value primary care or what we in Australia call general practice. Um, and the more I also appreciate how undervalued it is within our healthcare system, where in Australia, it's medical specialists who have higher status and higher income than GPs. And it's actually interesting to know that there's a parallel session on primary care, uh, parallel to this session, which I'm just delighted um, to, to, to know about. But, you know, for example, ever increasing specialization, arguably, is a recipe for unleashed health expenditure, as in the US, which has got the greatest expenditure on health as a proportion of GDP of any country, but is not matched by having the best health outcomes. So as I stand here today, my sense is that investment in specialization, which is required, must be matched by commensurate investments in primary care, which can act as the gatekeeper to more expensive specialist services. And this is particularly important when we're thinking about preventive efforts around building health literacy, around early intervention. Because whilst it would be great, for example, to have, have um, highly trained cardiologists who could treat malignant hypertension, it would be far better and cheaper to have had that hypertension treated in much earlier stages by primary care as part of which has identified it as part of routine health assessments. And certainly for adolescents who commonly have highly undifferentiated healthcare needs or who don't present to health services around sensitive needs, primary care services are critical. 
But in terms of driving that, professional leadership is also required. And in my experience, whether it's gastroenterology as a specialist area or whether it's primary care, professional leadership drives quality and develops new models of care. And it's for this reason that I spent about a decade in Australia advocating for the development of accredited specialist training in what we call now adolescent and young adult medicine in Australia through the Royal Australasian College of Physicians, which we achieved in 2017. And this is now providing a cadre of medical experts in paediatrics and internal medicine who are the future, you know, these guys are going to be training the next generation of medical students and junior doctors around how to work with young people. They will be the ones driving service innovation around adolescent health needs, and they will be also driving research um, as well. Now, while I appreciate the multidisciplinarity of adolescent health, we really do need adolescent medical specialists. And as president of the International Association of Adolescent Health, you know, I found it interesting to reflect that I'm not aware of any specialists in adolescent medicine from Sri Lanka. And I would challenge the field here by suggesting that whilst you've got fabulous specialists in obstetrics and gynecology, you've got fabulous specialists in public health, in um, sexual and reproductive health more broadly, you also need specialists in adolescent medicine. This is no longer good enough for Sri Lanka not to have this. Thank you, Professor Sawyer. Uh, um, you touched on a few uh, Interesting, and interesting, I and I think quite, quite actually, actually valid points. Valid that points that we should move, move forward with. with. Uh, in the essence, uh, in of, the time, essence of time, I'm going to move to Professor Sena at, at, at the moment. Uh, uh, but I will come back to you and ask you with how this leadership has affected the new normal and how that has come about. But in order to move forward with Professor Hemanta Sena Nayanka, uh, just a background on. What I want to know is the public health care system in Sri Lanka has engaged well with most marginalized communities. We have uh, a robust policy system. Uh, we have a lot of work around sensitizing healthcare workers on care for people living with HIV as well as trans persons. Um, however, we still see a certain resistance to change. We understand that this, uh, as uh, Ritsu pointed out, it comes from certain cultural biases and understanding of care. Uh, in your experience, Professor, um, with maternal care and gynecology, what are some of the improvements as well as the challenges you have seen with providing care for marginalized communities and uh, not just the aging population, sexual and gender minorities, but uh, as we spoke, um, um, intersecting, intersecting issues that we issues see, that we see uh, of, uh, persons of persons who, who are, marginalized are marginalized due to socioeconomic statuses or different um, other social factors. Thank you, Shiral, Thank for, you, Shiral for introducing, and introducing me and, and, and for, and for um, um, getting a kind getting of a vista for this uh, presentation. I want to thank the SLMA and the UNFPA for giving me this chance to speak to you today. So Shiral, this session is all about universal access to healthcare to everybody. And you mentioned some of the uh, marginalized um, populations. You talked about the aging people. Um, I want to talk about that, but first of all, I want to highlight some of the things uh, that I have experienced in providing healthcare about less obvious marginalized people. So I really um, twisted the, uh, this, the, the theme of this uh, session to ask you this question. Is indifference, ignorance, and prejudices on the part of the care providers impacting on quality of care? Are we, based on our prejudices and our own indifference, leaving people behind? And I want to ask you, are we not leaving behind less obvious marginalized people? I can talk to you about the, 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 the transgender people because I have been providing care for particularly the, the female transgender people for some time and I have, been, I have seen the transition of this. Uh, I think we have made giant strides in that. And, uh, but I can 
I can share with you experiences that I have had in the early days of providing those things. And some of those difficulties were unimaginable. About the aging population, I admit that there is not enough being done, just like the Professor Sawyer showed us uh, about the adolescent specialists. But let me just take you to some other aspects of my uh, work. I'm an obstetrician, as you've heard, uh, and respectful care during childbirth has been a major area of my interest uh, in, in my work. When it comes to respectful care, we really didn't have a framework to, as to what constitutes respectful care until this group in 2018 put out this, uh, um, the framework consisting of these 12 components and we can compare quality based on these components. Out of these, I have been concentrating and that really I would say it's been the mission of my life um, I speak a lot about it whenever I get a chance, and I believe this is the magic bullet in improving quality of care. Of course, we need to look at women's dignity. How often do we think in terms of dignity, in terms of the doctor-client relationship, particularly in the public sector? So, if you talk about the family and community support, which you can see on the, uh, the left-hand corner at the bottom here. If you have somebody with a laboring woman, basically you are empowering that woman. Labor is unique. It's a, it's a deeply emotional experience for the woman. And uniquely, it leaves a woman helpless. There is pain. And there are so many things that are happening. It's a dynamic process. Things can go wrong. And the woman depends a lot on the healthcare provider for her well-being during that time. But if there is somebody else there who is standing, seated, or erect, that empowers the woman. And I believe that that will take care of dignity. The woman will get more inf information. There'll be better informed consent. There's a lot written about, you'd be surprised about how much is written about mistreatment and harm during labor. There's, there are a lot of papers coming out about it. Effective communication will be addressed. So that's why I said having family and community support is like a magic bullet for a laboring woman. In 2018, the WHO put out this document uh, intrapartum care, how to give intrapartum care or labor care for women, for them to have a positive childbirth experience. Don't forget, some women end up with PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder, because of their labor experiences. So these are some of the things that they have said. Again, that companion of choice of the woman is recommended, and that is, like I said, my life's mission. Historically, women have helped women who are laboring. But in modern times, in the name of safety, sterility, etc., we have taken that companionship out. But somebody might ask you, so what about a companion? I mean, it's, isn't it like going for a coffee or a tea with your partner, sitting and talking? That's companionship. But let's see what a companion can do to the progress of labor and the outcomes of labor. So there are two Cochrane reviews, which is really the Rolls Royce of all systematic reviews. And there are two on this aspect. And both of them concur about the outcomes that it can produce for a labor. You can have a spontaneous vaginal birth. The mother will have a positive birth experience. The woman feels less pain. And therefore, she leads, requires less analgesia. It's a shorter labor. That's really an obstetrician's dream. And lesser cesarean births. Now, Sri Lanka, if you talk about cesarean sections, and 
year on year, we are having an increase in the cesarean section rates, and we are going higher and higher in that global uh, league of cesarean section rates. So here is another reason why we should be using it. But then, we've, in fact, I must tell you that we've even, we even have a circular issued by the Ministry of Health saying to encourage a companion in labor. But it is still observed in the negative. Most women in our country will labor alone. And I really think that's morally reprehensible. We have to address that. But it's a complex issue. So we tried to look at this um, um, issue in more, more detail. And uh, we uh, sent a questionnaire to our specialist colleagues. As you know, our, most of our, all, all our specialists will have uh, tra some training in a first world country. Uh, so they're expo exposed to these things, uh, having a companion, etc. So we wanted, and then basically they are the decision makers in our situation, in our system, in what will happen in an obstetric unit. So we sent a questionnaire to them to ask them what they thought about it. And if you want to read the full text, it's there in the BMC, Pregnancy and Childbirth. But these are some of the, the, the salient features that I want to um, share with you. One of the main de determinants of uh, whether an uh, obstetrician allowed a partner to be there, or a, com a companion to be there, is the knowledge that person had about those benefits that I showed you from the Cochrane reviews. Somebody who knows more has a higher ch chance that a companion will be allowed. The busier the obstetric unit, the lesser the chance, but I really think for the busy units as well, it has, and I my unit was a busy unit and we pioneered it and pushed it. One of the other things was that uh, people felt that uh, there wasn't enough space in between the beds, less privacy. If you go down, you can say, uh, you can see people are saying we don't have curtains to separate the beds, but really that's really 5,000 rupees to uh, put up some curtains. But I want to say these are some of the findings in this, but actually, I believe the problem is one of confidence in the ability of their staff and what they can do. But our own experience in this very cramped labor rooms, uh, in my own units, where we have 30 inches between two beds, but you can see a companion, the mother of this lady who is in labor, stroking her back. And we did it. And we have a file full of letters written to us by these people who saying us, saying to us, you know, how grateful they were for this experience. Uh, both the companions and the clients also sent us these things. But like I said, I think we need to look at this issue more, more deeply and we must try to address it as a healthcare system. In my department, we are addressing the quality of health and we are studying uh, and studying these issues. And uh, here is uh, from a study done by my junior colleague, Mohammed Rishad. We are looking at uh, our clients' perceptions and quality of care. So we're looking at person-centered maternity care, and that's one of the, the part of the themes of this uh, session. So with this group, uh, developed a, a scoring system, but this is another scoring system for determining the quality of care. And there are five domains in this. And we looked at our own statistics based against that from my own unit. So as you would expect, the physical aspects are very good. The use of a partogram, the lack of stimulation, the not using stimulation for labor, delivery in non-supine positions. However, here is a unit that's trying to promote a companion, but only 17% of our women had a companion during labor. So this is one of the problems we have. If you take the, the PCMC scale I talked about earlier, most of these are actually halfway through. If the full scale, if you take dignity and respect, it's halfway there. If you take community, communication and autonomy, uh, it's one third of the way forward. Uh, in supportive care, it's again only halfway through the, the maximum we can score. But again, this is complex because we find that the less empowered women 
will give higher scores for what they got because they're grateful for anything they will get. So this is how we stand against some of the other countries. We are not doing too well. The green bar here at the end here is Sri Lanka. We can do better than that. I want to leave you there and just take you to another aspect. I'm reviewing the maternal deaths uh, over the past uh, five years. And I looked at the socioeconomic status of the women who died. And here's what I found. And these are the from the, 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 from the Excel file. I have taken off the, 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 the occupation uh, column. And what I have shaded here are the people that I am certain are of a low socioeconomic status. Monthly income, less than 15,000 rupees. And amongst the women who died in the last five years, 81.8% belong to this group. So again, this is complex. We need to look at that. But are we providing equal care for the socially and economically disadvantaged? So there might be unseen discrimination and things we need to be addressing. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, Professor. I think you, you touched on some uh, interesting uh, socioeconomic factors there, and I think uh, it's a good transition for us to get a community standpoint in terms of uh, speaking about um, what kind of issues, uh, healthcare-related needs and SRH-related needs that um, uh, communities of uh, certain socioeconomic marginalization as well as uh, persons who are living with disabilities. So we will now uh, turn to Ms. Tansila Khan uh, and I would like to pose the question. So during this unprecedented time um, of COVID-19, what has health services been like uh, for marginalized communities, especially people living with disabilities? How has the access to health shifted? Um, give us a little idea about, from your experience, how our operations should shift or improve if and how you see it, and um, how should we be constructing new and innovative approaches from your standpoint uh, as a community person in order to uh, not uh, leave anyone behind? Thank you, Sriyal, uh, for your question, and uh, it is a time of uncertainty and uh, right now the whole fight for inclusion was about accessibility accessibility towards services towards products towards the public spaces but everything has come to a halt and much of the work that uh, myself included and a lot of others like me were doing uh, has been paused and we don't know where we will begin once this pandemic is over. My work is about delivering products. I do believe in uh, making sure that there are bridges out there where women, men, anybody who's facing a barrier can at least get their products. In my case, one basic product is menstrual hygiene, but our services are not just limited to that. Uh, we have moved towards reproductive health care. And during this pandemic, we are also providing products to fight COVID-19, such as masks, KN95, surgical masks, hand sanitizers, hand washes. My work has been interesting because uh, though I'm a person with disability and uh, I am somebody who's also a beneficiary of a lot of work that I'm doing. But I've noticed that when it comes to barriers, um, there are many groups out there with fully abled bodies that also face those bar barriers and women being a large group in that. And uh, even today in Pakistan, menstrual health care, reproductive health care is a big taboo. And slowly another taboo is emerging and that is of Corona shaming as well. Uh, it's very difficult to talk about Corona. Of course, there's a lot of gossip about in, in which part of the country, how many cases they are. But if anybody is facing just simple symptoms of a cough or a fever, 
they are less likely to talk about it so we receive those calls we receive uh, those queries about what to do and what to access and what kind of tests are available and uh, like my introduction mentioned that we have successfully penetrated into villages and smaller cities which is the toughest part because uh, technology is scarce over there uh, we're also a country uh, that faces challenges when it comes to electricity and technology but uh, slowly uh, these solutions are being implemented and even if the, these solutions are there there's a huge inequality when it comes to who accesses them for example if there's a family uh, in a village there's only one phone and that probably belongs to the male uh, the, the male head of the family so many times we get queries from different men who are supportive and they say okay this is for my sister this is for my wife for this is for my daughter so we want to order these products so that is like these are interesting qualitative uh, data that we're getting that we're uh, receiving and one quick thing i'd also like to share is that because of the pandemic many of the services has uh, they have been shut down uh, not just healthcare services but general lifestyle services so there's a huge influx that has been diverted towards online e-commerce and digital services so uh, initially we thought that people are less likely to opt for technological um, solutions because they're so comfortable in their own ways but now we see an increase in that so i'm also hopeful that um, education would increase there'll be more technological literacy and we will be able to use that for our work to make sure that healthcare information services and products uh, reach out to every nook and corner of the nation so um, as much as i am worried and uh, i feel i feel devastated to hear about a lot of uh, deaths and a lot of casualties and families that have been affected i also think that we are all in this together and we're fighting towards making sure that we can fight off the inequality and so far because of technology people with disabilities have been able to benefit but there's a there's a long walk uh, to go to until we could celebrate thank you thank you thansela um I I also want to um pose a question regarding girly things and how that has opened a client centric service system uh, especially for young women like you mentioned uh, in terms of uh, breaking down the traditional sort of barriers that are available um during this time um how do you think the kind of learnings from girly things can be utilized for other marginalized communities is there some kind of um, insight that you could provide to us further from the data that you have gathered in terms of uh, uh, the srh service but in terms of breaking down traditional barriers and providing uh, solutions for marginalized communities menstrual healthcare or reproduction or uh, reproductive healthcare issues problems related to a lot of these areas they do not discriminate against anybody for example initially we thought that these problems are more prevalent in the rural areas women do not have access to information and services and products so we were focused over there but something happened that we were receiving queries from the most posh areas of pakistan and these queries were about really basic ideas about vaginal care and um having access to any kind of basic service and that's when we realized that the taboo is so strong across uh, ac- across every class that even if a woman feels that she is extremely empowered and she has the access she still faces the barrier of the taboo and that was a that was a it it was a surprising revelation to us because we were focused on on just one side of the spectrum but that's not true and i think whenever we're designing campaigns or whenever we're trying to design a project we need to keep in mind that just because a female gets to travel around the world or if she has a job or if she is like an elderly figure in the family uh, somewhere the barrier of taboo is still over there so we need to keep that in mind we cannot disregard that and that is what i learned through my work of girly things when the orders for a basic sanitary napkin would come from one of the richest families of lahore that is when i thought that uh, the problem is much more than how we perceive it thank you tanzila thank you tanzila i mean i think it's a uh, taboo 
uh, that intersects socioeconomic statuses as well as professions is a good way for us to transition into our next speaker, uh, Dr. Suchita Dalvi. In your discussions as a feminist gynecologist, you shed a lot of light on the reality of care from the other side of the consulting table, uh, along the lines of uh, how deep-rooted um, patriarchal medical education systems have um, disadvantaged, disadvantaged patients as patients. well as women in uh, gynecological services as well as other medical services. Can we speak a little bit about your experiences and challenges that you have witnessed over the years around this and how has this upbringing specifically affected the care of SRH services? Yes, thank you so much. I'm trying to do a screen share. I hope it's working. Uh, thank you very much uh, for the privilege and the honor of being invited to be part of this August gathering as well as this uh, very dynamic panel. Uh, I would like to thank the UNFPA as well as the Sri Lanka Medical Association for the opportunity to share my thoughts um, at this meeting. So your question, Shriyal, I will start off with you know saying uh, uh, I, I listened in on the last bit of uh, Dr. Hendrick's presentation and I'm really delighted that all the speakers before me on this panel have said things which kind of dovetail into the conversation I want to have around the gender politics of medicine. And I want to start off by talking about a word that gets rarely spoken about, but is very integral to the way we learn as well as practice medicine, and that is patriarchy. Uh, so patriarchy, as most of you would have heard the name, but just to unpack it very quickly, it is basically a system which privileges uh, the men or those who identify as men, uh, you know, uh, within every possible intersection of its functioning. And it works on the assumption that men have a certain privilege or an entitlement simply because they are born men. And it is this kind of a system which, you know, even Tanzila spoke just now about the stigma and taboo around menstruation. Uh, but it also attaches itself to other issues around sexuality. And I'll elaborate a little bit on that uh, as I speak. Uh, so I just want to say, you know, I found it very interesting. Uh, Dr. Hendrik was asked a question about, uh, you know, doctors entering politics. And I I heard uh, a response that some doctors are standing for the elections in Sri Lanka. But I would like to quote um, Rudolf Verkau here, who most of you would be familiar with, uh, who said, medicine is a social science and politics is nothing else but medicine on a large scale. And I think in the time of the pandemic has really proved his words so true uh, because we can see, of course, the, you know, the complete debacle that is happening with the way they are uh, managing the pandemic in the US uh, and the way that some of the countries in Asia have actually uh, you know, we've seen very successful politicians have managed to control uh, the pandemic. So I think his words are so true. But I would like to also reflect on the description that I've given for him. He's called the father of um, modern pathology. And I always find that interesting. And, you know, those of you, all of you who are doctors here, uh, would know that we're always taught, you know, father of this and father of that. Uh, but there is, there is no mother uh, of any um, specialized uh, field in medicine. And that's because, uh, you know, women were at the point that medicine became formalized and a system was created. Women were not actually allowed into medical colleges. A uh, wide range of reasons were given. Uh, one was they said that they have smaller brains. Uh, the other, they said that the academic stresses would, uh, you know, have an effect on their ovaries and they would not be able to reproduce. Um, and another reason given was that they would be a distraction to the male students. So the assumption always was the default was the male student and the women were kind of, you know, given these privileges or uh, extra special uh, allowances. Um, so modern medicine, as we know it, are also entrenched deep into patriarchy, as well as a feudal capitalist system. Uh, and this book, uh, whose image I'm showing here, if anyone's interested, it's available as a PDF on uh, the Internet. Uh, called Witches, Midwives and Nurses, which talks about the 1400s when there was a social upheaval, which was shaking feudalism as it, at its roots. There were mass peasant uprisings and there was a beginning of capitalism. And it was at this time that the women healers were branded as witches and many of them were killed. Uh, and in the vacuum that was created in the absence of these women healers, uh, began this whole practice of, you know, the barber surgeons took over uh, and systems were created, attempts to formalize uh, the kind of medicine Whereas it is actually the witches, the so-called witches, who are um, who, to whom we owe the discovery of many of the modern drugs we use, such as aspirin, belladonna, digital, digitalis, ergot, and quinine. And it's interesting because at the time that the witches were using these medicines, uh, which we now recognize as modern medicines, the religious, uh, you know, forces were actually recommending chanting and leeches and bloodletting. Um, 
however, women were not allowed into these medical colleges, as I said. And uh, I think the roots of that really need to be understood uh, if we are to go forward in a way which is equitable. I know we are speaking about, you know, leave no one behind uh, in terms of um, the community at large. But I think it's also important to recognize that there's a whole subset of community within the medical profession which has been left behind uh, repeatedly, right from the beginning. So women healers were trivialized as old wives' tales. And, you know, we were told that modern medicine is what we need to uh, believe in. But then modern medicine also at one point in their textbooks and learning taught us that electroconvulsive therapy was needed uh, for those who had deviant sexuality. Uh, so, you know, we speak of the LGBTQI um, inclusiveness now, but we must remember that there was a time when that was not uh, acceptable or possible. Even now, virginity uh, takes up half a page or one page in forensic textbooks. And that has always puzzled me because virginity is not a medical condition. Um, it's a sociocultural, uh, you know, situation. And uh, again, as Tanzila said, it's a stigma, it's a taboo around conversations of female sexuality. And we speak so much of SRHR. But the reality is that the S of the SRH is very rarely explored in depth for us, even as medical students or as medical professionals. And it's mostly a focus on reproductive health. Uh, so these are things, you know, I just wanted to unpack for us to be able to, I, I don't have any specific answers, but for us to be starting to ask new questions about who is it that we are actually leaving behind and who else do we need to take along with us. Um, for example, this, this is an interesting phenomenon which happened a couple of years ago. Uh, all the gynecologists in the room and, and all of us actually would have heard of James Marion Sims because of the Sims speculum which he um, invented. And again, he's known as the father of modern gynecology. And I, I would really be interested in knowing if anyone has a name of anyone who's a mother of anything, uh, just you know, for my in intellectual curiosity. But as we know, James Marion Sims conducted a lot of experiments on female slaves in the southern states of the United States uh, who were afflicted with vesicovaginal fistulas, uh, which as we know is caused by you know, prolonged and obstructive labor. But he felt that the surgery was not painful enough to justify the trouble. And he did all these without anesthesia. Uh, so, you know, we, I think we really do need to know our history, no matter how dark and, and depressing and unfortunate it is in terms of modern medicine as to where we have come from. And as a result of a lot of advocacy by, um, you know, black women and uh, doctors and professionals in the southern states, his statue was recently taken down from Central Park. So some kind of reparations and restorative measures. And as we know, you know, positive discriminations are perhaps required, because even now, I think, what has happened is there are many women students at entry level in medicine, but I think 10 years down the line, the situation changes when we see that the male students prioritize surgical and high intensity and high earning fields, whereas the women uh, usually end up taking, you know, nine to five jobs or what are seen as more family friendly uh, postgraduate uh, uh, career choices. And that is what leads to this. Uh, it, it's surprising. I was able to find data from the UK. I was not able to find any such data from India or Sri Lanka or anywhere in Asia, actually. Uh, which again, I think as, as the, you know, uh, Professor Susan was also saying, uh, you know, where are the numbers from our uh, part of the world? But female physicians under the age of 45 have the highest rates of burnout. Uh, why is it? Uh, because in the medical profession, if we are not, you know, if you're gender blind, uh, then is it something else that is influencing them? And I think as is obvious from the cartoon uh, that I'm showing here, um, women medical professionals face many, many different barriers and challenges. And unless we are able to recognize those and be able to offer them some solutions to be equitable with their male colleagues, uh, I'm afraid we're going to end up leaving them behind because the burnout means they're going to retire early, they're going to take up part-time jobs, uh, they're not going to choose specializations, and that is indeed a, a, would be a loss to our profession. Uh, I also looked at something which is more you know, tangible and easy to measure in terms of earning capacities. And as shocking, um, well, maybe not so shocking, is that 95% of the highest paid NHS consultants are men and only five are women. And when we look at how much male and female physicians make, so, you know, whatever parameters you take, whether it is mental health and um, commitment to the career or whether it is the earning capacities, we are leaving the women medical professionals behind. And I think that is something we need to also look at because that's also a politics. Uh, it's not just the community level health politics, but it's also an internal politics. And uh, maybe the beginning uh, of this could be made in medical colleges. Um, so some of the work that the Asia Safe Abortion Partnership is doing is with a lot of young people. We have members in 23 countries across South and Southeast Asia, as well as Southwest Asia and the Pacific. And this is a group of uh, medical students we've been working with. And uh, they, they made up this t-shirt for themselves. And uh, many of them are now uh, interns. And uh, one of them just, just yesterday, last evening, uh, texted me 
about uh, uh, you know uh, uh, anatomy textbook uh, they found and this is a quote from it uh, which talks about salpingitis and says in recent times the incidence has increased in modern females probably because they miss morning bath in order to report to duty on time and waste time in makeup i mean I, you know i would be really hard pressed to find a more unscientific and blatantly misogynistic uh, statement and this is in a in an in an actual textbook which is being currently used by medical students uh, which is horrible but i think to me it's a ray of hope that the medical student who read this realized it was offensive and problematic uh, and you know felt compelled to share it uh, he shared it it was a male student who actually also shared it on his twitter and instagram and i think that to me is actually a step forward uh, you know hopefully in leaving no one behind uh, and just to say that you know what lies behind us and what lies before us are tiny matters uh, compared to what lies within us and i really hope that the medical profession as a whole will take this opportunity of the covid 19 um where we can see that the domestic chores have been taken over more by women even though they are still frontline workers whereas tanzila said the women frontline workers you know their menstrual hygiene is not being um, uh, you know looked at uh, as as an issue of equity and uh, justice uh, and i think we need to introspect and see how we can use these opportunities to emerge as as a better um, you know literally the sort of the leaders in society that we've always been looked up uh, to being and uh, find ways to leave no one behind even within our profession so i'll i'll close there uh, thank you so much uh dr uh, dalvi uh, i think while we have you i I'd, i'd like to touch a little bit about uh the current situation uh around the pandemic around countries being under lockdown and with your experience and the current concerns around um what this means for access for contraception and safe abortions uh how has your experience been over the past 3 to 6 months with the current situation um what have you seen that has been done that uh, you either feel is uh, is an improvement or that needs improvement is are there any innovative approaches that has been used in your experience uh, through your initiative or otherwise that question yes it's very important to root ourselves within the current pandemic and uh, again to reflect on what tanzila said there has been uh, a lot of problems in terms of barriers to access because many women young girls unmarried young people who were otherwise able to take the opportunity of their mobility and freedom to be able to access whether it was an srh clinic or it was just simple you know purchasing condoms or pills from a pharmacist are unable to do so now Uh, there has been a lot of lack of privacy because all family members are available all the time uh, explanations are being sought for why do you want to go out particularly in countries which are in lockdown uh, some people women who found out that they were pregnant just prior to lockdown in many of the countries uh, were unable to access first trimester abortion so they ended up coming later in the pregnancy than they would have um, some of the countries have expanded the scope of telemedicine to be able to include uh, you know these services uh, within it but again there are places where online access is not uh, available not feasible uh, again you know if there is only one phone in the house it's usually the elderly male uh, in the house who would have access to it so definitely the pandemic has created a lot of problems for people uh, but also i think what it has done is it has magnified the existing barriers so it's not as though there were you know there are some new barriers but it has been a magnification of existing barriers so i think the uh, you know middle class population is now facing Uh, what a rural population has been facing for all these decades or what people with certain vulnerabilities whether they are adolescents or people living with disabilities or you know in any other way marginalized communities have always been facing uh, they have now become visible which is why they have suddenly become headlines uh, whereas uh, you know many people were facing those barriers already and i think we do need a kind of a reboot you know maybe the new normal needs to be kind of a, a public health 2.0 or something so that we address all these issues and find a way to reach the unreached um in ways that maintains their dignity and in a way that is done in an empowering way not as someone who's a beneficiary of our you know generosity and kindness uh but as equal and equitable members of our society um thank you dr dalvi um we uh, are now ready to move uh, into a q and a session for a discussion i have a few questions for the panelists but uh, anyone who's joining us on zoom please uh, share your questions on the zoom uh, question or chat box and then uh, we will post those questions to the panelist uh, just transitioning from uh, what tanzila as well as uh, dr dalvi spoke about in terms of lack of privacy in terms of uh, 
a revamping of public health. Um, I'd like to uh, ask a question from Professor Susan Sawyer about her experience in Australia regarding during this time, um, has there been any innovative approaches that you have tested out and possibly um, found promising that can be utilized by any of us uh, in, in the other parts of the world uh, under any other disciplines, uh, especially around healthcare services? areas people have had to travel very long distances for health so that telehealth has long been a feature of care there unlike where I come from in Victoria where the geographical barriers haven't been so great so that whilst at the children's hospital we have had a telehealth facility I certainly as a paediatrician hadn't particularly embraced it in more than, you know, I reckon a handful of cases before the pandemic, but that obviously um, we've all just pivoted um, immediately over to telehealth. And I think a little bit as Suchita was highlighting, you know, this has not been without problem. Um, certainly it's far better to be able to have access to something rather than nothing because of the concerns that so many um, patients had about the fear of accessing in person any um, health services. So we've certainly seen you know, dramatic declines in presentations of people to emergency departments, adults with chest pain, for example. But that around adolescent healthcare, you know, it's been a two-edged sword, I'd say, because firstly, you know, the inequities of... Um, uh, uh, access uh, have been amplified even during telehealth so that um, you can really tell that, um, you know, it's the quality of the, the, um, uh, the transmission, you know, the quality of people's lines um, is huge. You know, you can see people from, from richer backgrounds pay more and have a better quality of, of um, line. There's less echo, you can more engage. They've got families who are more experienced technologically and they are better able to orientate the child and themselves to uh, telehealth as well. I've had lots of um, uncertainties about how well I'm able to actually provide have a space for private consultations when I've wanted to consult with young people by themselves. So I've often stopped telehealth and instead asked for young people to have a consultation with me by phone. Um, and just yesterday I had one of those with a young person who was walking around the block as we were talking about um, the domestic violence that was happening in her family, which I was not prepared to talk about um, at home. But that uncertainty about privacy and confidentiality when you're using telehealth um, is, is a problem even here in Australia. Um, and so I, I think we're going to come to a new normal that recognises that there are many benefits of it, but it's certainly by no means a panacea. Thank you, Professor. Thank Sorry. You, Professor. Sorry. Um, um, it, it was interesting, was that, interesting you that you pointed out that um, people of certain socioeconomic classes uh, have better access to uh, health uh, I would like to move uh, to Professor Hemanth in order to uh, discuss a little bit about what he spoke about in terms of socioeconomic status and um, marginalization due to economic status. Um, in a new normal, Professor, uh, when we are looking at uh, systems, I, I understand that a lot of these systems would involve a lot of technology, which uh, again would be creating another barrier uh, depending on the kind of class or socioeconomic status you are in. Uh, in your expert opinion and uh, your sort of learned understanding, how do you think we could uh, tackle these barriers of um, socioeconomic status in functioning in a new normal so that we can uh, make sure that everyone is included in these services that we provide? I think the, um, it's not, not a straightforward answer that we can give for that because uh, I think we are talking about a new normal in, in Sri Lanka, but I think by and large we are operating as a normal now uh, because of the, 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 the numbers that of COVID. That's the first thing. And we talked about this, uh, the socioeconomic status and, and the contribution 
And I think it's really a matter of empowerment. Uh, like I said, it's, you can't give a straightforward answer to this because say for example, in the maternal debts that I talked about, so the lower socioeconomic uh, status people might find it difficult to come and there is the first delay in the reasons for the maternal debts. So seeking care might be a problem. Uh, when it comes to heart disease complicating pregnancy, uh, in the very often in the lower socioeconomic state, the classes, we find that uh, people are hiding these uh, major heart uh, diseases that are sort of in which situations they shouldn't be getting pregnant. Uh, but for social reasons, they will hide it because they want to get married and, and have some kind of security. So this is a problem that needs to be looked at in, in more detail. Um, like I said again about the companion during labor, uh, that is again, say for example, that same woman, if she finds the money to go to a private hospital, you know, she will have the benefit of a companion and maybe one or two companions during labor. And it might be the, uh, the same team that's providing the care. You know, so this, uh, there are issues of equity and equality here. And these are things that have got ingrained in our, our, our minds. And I think, so those have to be addressed. And our medical schools, like a lot of medical schools in, 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 in the world, do not teach rights-based approach. You know, when I was trying to bring that into my medical school, um, I was told, no, we are teaching them ethics. But these are two different things. Ethics is something that you got to practice as a, as a doctor, but the rights is inherent, like the dignity that in the, we heard about in the previous section. So the rights is something that the woman or man or the client can demand, but there is no such imposition on, on the ethics side of it. So I think there's got to be a major kind of a rebooting, resetting of how we are thinking and approaching these things. You know, I, I think our healthcare system needs to address this issue of equity in a, in a, in a more major way. And, and I mean, this is, uh, you know, even how a person from a lower rung treats a person who is less empowered is different to how they would treat somebody with, and it's, they are coming to the same system. So we need to rethink, and I, th I think that's the thing that we need to be um, addressing in the new normal, and I'd really like to see that happen. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Professor. I, I think uh, what you said, uh, sometimes uh, two people accessing the same kind of healthcare services uh, from two different classes, or even just by appearance, uh, we've seen uh, even within the government sector or the private sector in Sri Lanka especially gets differential treatment. Uh, there is a uh, sort of looking down upon uh, people and kind of sometimes not uh, taking into consideration that some people are informed and make certain informed healthcare decisions. Um, I'd like to um, pose a question to uh, Dr. Suchitra Dalvi. Uh, coming from a rights-based approach, um, we do have uh, a robust policy system in Sri Lanka around healthcare, system, around healthcare uh, especially around um, uh, people living with HIV, uh, uh, SRH services for young adults, etc. But um, we we face these sort of barriers from a policy level to an implementation level, uh, and in sort of small subunits of care, uh, we we face the challenges. Even though you have the policy in place, uh, that policy is not being implemented or. Uh, accepted, uh, similar to uh, what Professor Sendanayaka said. From your opinion, um, how do you think that this can be uh, better tackled uh, through the sort of medical health professions? And how how do you how have you seen that? Have you seen this uh, being improved in any setting? Or if not, are there any sort of uh, solutions that you can provide or insights that you can provide to us? Thank you. That's a very interesting uh, question. I am not sure I can do full justice to it, but I would just like to say that uh, in any context where, as you say, you know, there is a policy in place, 
but implementation uh, is a problem. Uh, I think it always does come down to politics. So uh, it is the political will. And when I say political, I don't mean necessarily the politicians. And that is something which we need to learn from the feminist movement is that the personal is political. So the actions of every single person, whether a decision to agree, disagree, to be complicit or not, to you know follow through or not, these are all political decisions. Uh, because at an individual level, it may not seem that way. But if many individuals take the same decision, then suddenly it takes on a very different uh, political meaning. Um, so, you know, just to deviate a little bit from that in the context of, say, abortion services in some parts of Europe or in Latin America, they have what is called a conscientious objection, where if a doctor feels that my conscience doesn't allow me uh, to do something, then I am uh, I'm allowed to opt out of that particular service. But on the other hand, then how come we don't have a place for conscientious provision? whereby doctors can say, no, we believe that this is what needs to be done in the best, best interests of our uh, community. And as Dr. Hemanta said, you know, in terms of um, uh, the beneficiaries and their rights, uh, and to say that this is what we are going to do, uh, I think that will go a long way in ensuring that these policies actually get implemented and uh, shift practices, as well as the outcomes. Uh, because again, just shifting practices uh, may not always be enough because, you know, the health outcomes may not uh, actually change. So I think there is a there is a role for uh, doctors to become advocates. Um, and I think uh, particularly in the issue of, say, for example, intimate partner violence, I think the World Health Assembly had said a few years ago that the doctor is often the first and may sometimes be the only witness uh, for uh, rights violations of people they see uh, as patients. And therefore, it's their moral obligation to speak up on their behalf. So I think these kind of policies, as you're saying, you know, when there are barriers to implementation, I think doctors need to stand up and show their, their power and capacity to make a difference and bring about change. Thank you, Dr. Dalvi. We have a um, question from Dr. Asela for you. Uh, teaching on gender issues in Sri Lanka, uh, Sri Lankan medical schools are mainly around uh, sexual and gender-based violence and widowhood, etc. cetera. Uh, shouldn't... Uh, issues around discrimination, especially within the healthcare workforce, be addressed as well. And I uh, just want to add to it, how do you see that uh, happening in a uh, collaborative effort uh, if we are to talk about discrimination of marginalized communities and this being in included into a education system? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much, Dr. Asila. That's a very, very important question. And uh, as I said earlier, you know, uh, I'm I, so, sorry if I sound repetitious, but Personal is political. So I think those who are interested, and remember one thing in any system, whoever has the power is less likely to initiate a conversation about how to um, share the power. It will always be those who don't have the power who are going to have to, uh, you know, uh, try and obtain it. Um, and uh, that is the whole struggle. I mean, that's kind of what the whole process of advocacy is about. So I would suggest that if some like-minded individuals can come together, and as Shriyal said, you know, in a collaborative fashion, uh, place these discriminatory behaviors towards uh, healthcare workers within the larger spectrum of equalities uh, towards all. So leave no one behind would be the larger umbrella within which you would very rightfully include the fact that some healthcare professionals are being left behind, either because the way sociocultural systems are created, which force them to you know, take a step back or sacrifice or you know, uh, not prioritize their careers and therefore in the future uh, end up being the lesser paying and therefore the less empowered uh, with lesser choices. Uh, I think that could well fit in within this larger umbrella. And probably it's time, I think, so when I say, you know, I think a lot of us are very wary of the word politics because we've only seen it played out very badly by you know politicians i think in all countries are the same and we always identify it with something you know dirty politics something unpleasant power mongering uh, but the reality is that all of us are part of the politics whether we like it or not the only choice that is left for us is are we going to be passive recipients of someone else's politics or are we going to actively engage with what we believe in so i think that really is the choice you know the word activist um, is is you know makes us feel as though it's people who are going to always be doing street rallies and you know etc. But it's not true. Any one of us who speaks out, for example, I'll tell you a very, very basic example. So all of us are on WhatsApp groups. I'm on a WhatsApp group with my medical college friends. And there are still some people who will post a sexist joke. You know, 
so uh, most people will just say okay forget it it's not worth getting into the squabbles but i make it a point every time to explain that i found this offensive this is not appropriate and this is the reason why you know so i think it opens up these windows of opportunity for dialogues and to me that is also a political act uh, so if you have a medical students association or you have any opportunity within your professional body to create um, a separate task force or a separate group to talk about these conversations i think you know uh, as they say about planting a tree you know the best time was 20 years ago but then the next best time is today so if no one else is talking about the issue i think it would be great if you take the initiative and open up the conversation um i i would really look forward to that and uh, if you need anything from me anyone in the audience uh, would like to connect with me i would be more than willing to uh, offer some thank you dr dalvi uh, we have time for one more question uh, if there is any questions from the audience who are present here physically uh, we'd be happy to open up the floor all right i think uh, given the sort of physical virtual space and it's uh, novelty uh, this is an interesting sort of experience for all of us uh, moving into this sort of uh, un- new normal and unprecedented time i think there is a lot of uh, interesting information that was shared uh, around gathering data and how informed decisions can be made around data how uh technology is uh is key but that also may be creating certain barriers uh there is deep rooted social norms uh within our culture that we need to we need to address and um client centric care comes from also doctors and even though policies are in place this will not be implemented if you do not take the initiative to implement them and i think uh empowerment overall uh of patients of medical professionals of systems i think is a key uh knowledge and thought that we can take away from uh this conversation um i would like to uh thank the panelists for a very engaging discussion uh and i would like to also thank the sri lanka medical association for providing this opportunity for this conversation and the unfpa and everyone behind the scenes who's making this virtual physical uh panel discussion possible today uh so that we can uh, be broadcasting this uh, across uh country barriers so thank you everyone for joining this discussion um i hope you have a great day there are a few other sessions following up uh after this so please uh, join in to those discussions as well um thank you very much